Today we're in John's Gospel, and we're going to be looking at verses um, 11 through 18. As I share with you, out of John's Gospel, a, a portion of Scripture that relates to the uh, resurrection of Jesus Christ. And so let's begin reading together here in John chapter 20 at verse 11. I'll read to verse 18, give some introductory remarks, and then move into our study. John chapter 20, beginning at verse 11. But Mary stood outside by the tomb, weeping. And as she wept, she stooped down and looked into the tomb. And she saw two angels in white, sitting, one at the head and the other at the feet, where the body of Jesus had lain. Then they said to her, Woman, why are you weeping? She said to them, Because they have taken away my Lord, and I do not know where they have laid him. Now, when she had said this, she turned around and saw Jesus standing there and did not know that it was Jesus. Jesus said to her, Woman, why are you weeping? Whom are you seeking? She, supposing him to be the gardener, said to him, Sir, if you have carried him away, tell me where you have laid him, and I will take him away. Jesus said to her, Mary. She turned and said to him, Ravoni, which is to say, teacher. Jesus said to her, do not cling to me, for I have not yet ascended to my father. But go to my brethren and say to them, I am ascending to my father and to your father and to my God and your God. Mary Magdalene came and told the disciples, that she had seen the Lord, and that he had spoken these things to her. So we come to celebrate the resurrection of the Lord Jesus Christ. When Paul was speaking to the, or writing to the uh, Corinthians, he said that if Jesus Christ were still in the grave, then we of all people would be most to be pitied, because we're preaching a message that isn't true. Jesus Christ, he said, if it were not true, is still in the grave. So what's the point? But we as believers know that the resurrection is the center of our faith. We know that Jesus Christ was a good man. There's no doubt about it. Even secular writers will say that Jesus Christ was a good man. Jesus Christ, we know, was a prophet, and there's no doubt about that. He spoke out the word of God to the people. Jesus Christ was a teacher. He committed to us teachings that, that people had never heard before, and he did so with an eloquence and a depth that was unchallenged in his day. And he was all of those things. He was a good man, he was a teacher, he was a prophet, but he was more than that. You see, if he was not raised from the dead, then he remains in the grave to this day, and though, and, and though we claim to have relationship with him in reality, we would be no different than anybody else who simply has a favorite teacher or a favorite philosopher. But Christianity is built on one central belief, one central teaching, one central doctrine, and that is that Jesus Christ died, he was buried, but on the third day, he rose from the grave, and, and that's why we gather here today to celebrate the, the resurrection story of Jesus Christ, and that's why the church gathers every week as a fellowship. That's why we gather sometimes every day as a fellowship. That's why I individually follow Christ in a personal way from Monday through Sunday, because he's alive, and he has done something in my life that has transformed me. And so we gather here on Sundays to celebrate the resurrection of the Lord Jesus Christ. We've done so since his resurrection, and today, this is what we'll be looking at. Now, let me give to you a background, a little bit of a context for you to be able to view this passage by. In doing so, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to hearken to some of the scriptures that were said uh, from verses 1 through 10. I'm going to point to a few things because I want to develop a context with you. You see, at this time, Mary, who is called Mary Magdalene, Mary Magdalene has undergone incredible emotional trauma. Just one week before she had seen Jesus enter into Jerusalem to an incredible reception, it's called the triumphal entry. Jesus Christ had come into the city of Jerusalem. He had descended from the Mount of Olives. And as he had descended by the trail or through the road from the Mount of Olives, as he had come down and was approaching the city of Jerusalem, people from Jerusalem began to pour out of the city of Jerusalem People who were accompanying him began to follow after him, and the two crowds converged. And as the crowds began to converge, they began to cry out, and they were crying out, Hosanna, save now. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Blessed is the King of Israel. And they were doing so with great passion. They were doing so with great enthusiasm. They were throwing palm branches onto the ground so that 
he would go over them and, and they were waving palm branches in the air as he entered in through what is called the triumphal entry. And as he was coming, the religious leaders, the Pharisees, began to cry from the crowd and they spoke to Jesus and they said to him, Rabbi, tell your, tell your disciples to, to be quiet because they didn't appreciate the praise that was being given to Jesus Christ as he, as he was about to enter into, into the city. And, and Jesus said, I tell you, if, if they were to, to be silenced, the very stones themselves would begin to cry out. In other words, if you try and stifle praise from man, creation itself cries out to the worship of God, to the worthiness of Christ. Now Jesus entered in. He went through a few things during that week. And finally, he celebrated Passover with his disciples. As he was celebrating Passover, he was celebrating with them uh, the memory, the memorial of how the Jewish people uh, were delivered by God from Egyptian slavery. Now in the midst of all of this, things were not going as, as Mary had thought they would. You see, after celebrating the Passover meal, Jesus had been arrested. One of his own trusted disciples, a man by the name of Judas, was paid off 30 pieces of silver, which is the price of a slave. And he arranged an opportune time to betray Christ. Knowing that Jesus went into the Garden of Gethsemane, as was his habit, he brought a detachment of officers, and they came into that garden, and they took Jesus. Jesus actually submitted himself to them, had he desired to. Of course, they could have never have taken him. But they did. They took him. They tried him. They beat him, humiliated him, and ultimately they crucified him. Mary Magdalene was there when that happened. Mary was there with John and with Mary, the mother of Jesus. And she saw the Lord Jesus Christ as he was crucified. She heard the words that he spoke as he was hanging there on the cross. And she watched him as he, in the most agonizing way, died. And the pain, the pain of seeing this broke her heart. That had happened on Friday, just three days before. The shock and the pain would still be fresh within her. It had just happened. Just this morning after first service, I was in the front talking to and praying with people, and one of the members of our fellowship, a lady in our church, approached me, and she had this broken feel to her. She, her, her shoulders were, were slumped, and, and her face was, was drawn, and, and her eyes were filled with sorrow. And, and she said to me, Pastor, can you pray for me? Can you pray for me? My husband died on Friday. My husband died on Friday. And I looked at her, and I said, you know what Mary was feeling. You know the pain that Mary felt because she saw Jesus die. And you don't get over that kind of pain. You don't get over that kind of grief, that kind of trauma. You don't get over it that quickly. And Mary is suffering. She is suffering at this moment, the sense of loss and sorrow, the grief. Now, it had been three days, and the shock and the pain are still fresh within her. Jesus had been crucified on Friday. But he didn't receive the burial that, that Mary thought that he deserved. When you look in chapter 19 of John, verse 38, it reads, After this, Joseph of Arimathea, being a disciple of Jesus, but secretly for fear of the Jews, asked Pilate that he might take away the body of Jesus. And Pilate gave him permission. So he came and took the body of Jesus. And Nicodemus, who at first came to Jesus by night, also came bringing a mixture of myrrh and aloes, about a hundred pounds. Then they took the body of Jesus and, and bound it in strips of linen with the spices as the custom of the Jews is to bury. It wasn't an embalming that was taking place. It was a perfuming. They would put the perfumes in there just to break up the stench of death that would arrive normally around the fourth day. Now, she didn't believe that, that Jesus received the kind of burial that he deserved, but it's interesting to note that when it says in verse 39 of chapter 19 
that they used about 100 pounds, that tells us that that was sufficient to bury 200 people. So they gave to him an abundance, if you will, of spices and all, but still she said that's just not enough. He needs more honor than that. So Luke tells us in chapter 23, verses 55 and 56, the women who had come with him from Galilee followed after, and they observed the tomb and how his body was laid. They returned and prepared spices and fragrant oils, and they rested on the Sabbath according, according to the commandment. So at dawn, Mary and some of the other women came to the tomb in order that they might complete his burial. Luke tells us in chapter 24, verse 1, on the first day of the week, very early in the morning, they and certain other women with them came to the tomb, bringing the spices which they had prepared. But they found the stone rolled away from the tomb. Stone ro rolled away from the tomb. Well, that's what John is saying in chapter 20, verse 1, when he says, on the first day of the week, Mary Magdalene came to the tomb early while it was still dark and saw that the stone had been taken away from the tomb. Now, when you picture the tomb and all, it would have been a hollowed out, uh, out of rock, perhaps, and they had, uh, they had uh, the stone that would be in the shape of a wheel. And the stone was large. It weighed 6,000 pounds, and it was placed on an incline. And so the stone would have been like a wheel rolled down the incline, and then there was something carved out of the, out of the stone that when the wheel hit it, it would lock in. And then they had placed a seal on it so that if somebody had moved that, the seal would have been broken, and that would have been evidence that grave robbers had come and taken the body of Christ. And so because the uh, Pharisees had remembered what Jesus said when his own disciples had not, they were afraid that his disciples would come and take the body of Christ away, and then the report would go out that he had been resurrected, and uh, they were concerned, and they had said, the last deception will be worse than the first. And so they had done this, they had put the stone in order to prevent anybody from stealing the body. Now as we look at this, we, we see Mary coming to the tomb, and Mary coming to the tomb reveals something for us. It, it reveals her tremendous love for Jesus Christ. She had a love that drove her on, a love that caused her to get up early and to be there as early as possible so that she might be able to finish the burial. It also shows us that she has courage because she wasn't afraid to be identified with Christ in an open fashion, even though Rome was undoubtedly looking for his disciples. It shows us that she had a zeal. There was a fire within her heart for this man as well as a respect for him because it was dangerous for her to be there. When you look at Mary, you see a great example. You see a great example of a thankful sinner. You see a great example of somebody who has come to realize how much God loves them. She loved him deeply. And the love that she had for Jesus did not originate with her. It wasn't something that she invented. You know, we love him because he first loved us. The love that she had for Jesus that gave her the courage and gave her the zeal and all, that love that she had for Jesus came out of a heart that had been touched by the grace of God. And, and that's the best way, isn't it, to serve the Lord? Not out of, out of compulsion because you have to do that, because you think if you do certain things and you do them long enough and you do them well enough, it's going to cause God to have favor with you. There are people who date like that. They think if they pretend there's somebody else and they do certain things that the other person may like, that they may be able to artificially win their love for them. But when they take the mask off and they begin to show what they really are, they don't necessarily retain the love that they earned under false, under false conditions. One of the greatest things that happens is when you're just basically drawn by the love of God. Because you're not trying to do something, to perform something, to make him love you. God loves you already. God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. The world didn't begin to draw God's love. He loved us before. And that's how it works. And that's the grace of God. And she understood that. And so what happens? Well, she ran to inform the apostles. It says in verse 2, she went and told John and she told Peter. And they came to the tomb. Now Mary and other women with her saw that the stone had been rolled away and they had looked into the tomb. In Mark 16, 5 through 7, it says, Entering the tomb, they saw a young man clothed in a long white robe sitting on the right side. They were alarmed. But he said to them, Do not be alarmed. You seek Jesus of Nazareth who was crucified. 
He's risen. He's not here. See the place where they laid him. But go tell his disciples and Peter that he's going before you into Galilee. There you will see him as he said to you. Well, this they did. But the majority of the apostles didn't believe them. Luke tells us in chapter 24, 11, and 12, their words seemed to be like idle tales. They didn't believe them. But Peter arose and ran to the tomb, and stooping down, he saw the linen cloths lying by themselves, and he departed, marveling to himself at what had happened. And so in verse 3 here in chapter 20 of John, Peter therefore went out, the other disciple, and were going to the tomb. They both ran together. The other disciple outran Peter and came to the tomb first. He, stooping down and looking in, saw the linen cloths lying there, yet he didn't go in. Simon Peter came, following him, went into the tomb. He saw the linen cloths lying there, the handkerchief that had been around his head, not lying with the linen cloths, folded together in a place by itself. The other disciple who came to the tomb first went in also, saw and believed. For as yet they did not know the scripture that he must rise again from the dead. The, the disciples went away again to their own home. It's interesting to note, as is typical in the Gospel of John, that John leaves himself unnamed. I want you to notice how he refers to himself in verse 2. He refers to himself as the other disciple. Notice verse 3. Once again, he refers to himself as the other disciple. He left himself unnamed. There are other times when he speaks of himself in this way. He says, I am the one whom Jesus loved. And I've said this before, but it bears repetition at this point. When I was a younger believer and I would see the scripture, I would be reading the scripture, and then I would be reading how that he refers to himself as the one whom Jesus loved. I, I thought, what an arrogant thing to say. The one whom Jesus loved, like he didn't love everybody else. And I thought, that's kind of a prideful thing, isn't it? I mean, to sit down, you know, uh, and say, I'm the one who Jesus loved. I mean, if I walked in this room and I said, you know, I'm the one who Marie loved, you'd say, yeah, so what? You know, I, I, when I read the Bible, though, and I would see that he referred to himself as the one whom Jesus loved, it bothered me. And yet here we have it in John 20, he's referring to himself as the other disciple, also calls himself later on and before the one whom Jesus loved. But I find it interesting to note, and I'll say this quickly, but it's interesting when you compare and contrast the comments that the Apostle Peter made and the, and the way that John identified himself. Because the Apostle Peter said to Jesus, though all forsake you, yet I never will, I would even die for you. So what was he saying? The Apostle Peter was saying, I love you. I love you. Though all would forsake you, yet I would never. I love you. What are you saying? Peter was saying, I, I love you more than these. I love you more than the rest. When you look into the Bible, and the Bible gives us a commandment, the commandment is, Hear, O Israel, the Lord thy God is one, and thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all thy heart, with all thy soul, with all thy strength, with all your mind. There's a command that God gives to the people, love God with everything within you. Now, we behave on the basis of the things that we love. It's not just what we believe that motivates our activities because we believe a lot of things we don't do. And you'll see this in just a moment. You're going to see it with Mary. We're, we're motivated normally by the things that we love. And so God says to us, love me with all of your heart. Because when you love me with all of your heart, mind, strength, when you love me in that way, then we'll have relationships. So God calls us to love him with everything, not just a portion, but with everything. That's what the Bible teaches us to do. But then you have, you have guys like Moses, Moses who was inspired by God to write Deuteronomy chapter 6 that included that, that call to worship God. And then you look at the life of Moses and you discover that as much as he loved the Lord God, he misrepresented God and didn't even enter into the promised land. So it causes me to realize that though I'm commanded to love God with everything within me, it is also possible that I will fail to do that. You look at a man by the name of David, King David. Everybody knows King David, but if I say, King David, give me a name associated with him, what's the first name that comes to mind? 
Bathsheba. The first name that comes to mind with David is always going to be David and Bathsheba. It's not David and Solomon. It's not David and any of his other wives. It's not even David and Goliath. It is normally David and Bathsheba. Why? Because we remember his failure, not his success. That's how it works. And yet David is somebody who wrote so many psalms. He would be seated out in the wilderness. He was a shepherd boy. And he would say, when I behold the stars, when I look at the heavens and the stars that you have created, it, it causes me to wonder, what is man that you should even consider him, the son of man, that you would even give him a thought? David was the kind of person called the sweet psalmist of Israel who would write love songs to God. His heart was filled with love for God. God spoke of David in this way. He said, he is a man after my own heart. And yet David committed sin with Bathsheba. David got Bathsheba's husband Uriah killed. David was of that sort. And, and it teaches me something, guys. It teaches me that though God commands me to love him with everything within me, and he does, that even the greatest people in the, in the Bible never loved him that much. They did love him. But we all fail. And so it caused me to begin to realize that the safer self-identification will always be not David, the one who loves God, but David, the one who is loved by God. Because if I could understand even a little bit of his love for me, it changes my entire way of living because I'm loved by the greatest person in the universe and so are you. God so loved the world. You might as well put your own name in there. God so loved you. And he so loved you, he gave his son. But here we have Mary. We have Mary, somebody who loved the Lord so very much. She had an incredible love for Jesus Christ. And you have Peter, who loved the Lord. And you have John, who loved the Lord. But Peter and John are there viewing an empty tomb. And Peter has a different response than John. Peter sees an empty tomb. John sees and believes that Jesus had risen from the dead. As I mentioned a moment ago out of Luke 24, 12, it simply says that Peter departed marveling to himself at what had happened. You see, Peter was still dealing with the guilt of denying the Lord, and his eyes were still clouded by what he had done. We know that later on, Jesus will restore his beloved apostle, and at that moment, He's going through pain. And as this is all taking place, verse 11, Mary stood outside by the tomb, weeping. And as she wept, she stooped down, looked into the tomb. When it says Mary stood outside by the tomb, weeping, that word weeping is a very strong word. It, it, it speaks of mourning with pain and grief. It speaks of strong crying. Mary did love the Lord, and she was crying as if her heart would break. Have you ever cried like that? Some in this room have. Like your very heart would break. Have you ever cried with such pain that it feels as if your heart hurts, that there's a pain that's so deep inside that, that tears aren't even quenching the pain? I have, and I think some of you have too. The loss of something, the loss of a mama, the loss of a dad, the loss of a child, the loss of a grandmother, a grandfather, a friend, brother, sister. Something that is so severe and so, so deep. The loss of a relationship, the loss of a marriage. And you cry as if your very heart is going to break. And that's how she was doing. She was crying as if her heart would break. And she wouldn't leave. She didn't want to leave the place that the Lord had been buried in. She feared that his body had been stolen, that it would be abused by the evil people that took it. And as she's standing there, her mind is filled with all the evil that could be happening. Again, Mary loved the Lord with all of her heart. He had forgiven her. He had restored her. She had a, an incredible testimony, an unbelievable salvation experience with Jesus Christ. The Bible tells us that she was severely demon-possessed. She had seven demons. And Jesus delivered her. And after she'd been delivered by Jesus, she followed him as a grateful sinner would. She reminds me of an unnamed woman that we find in the Gospel of Luke. 
an unnamed woman who, who comes to a dinner party that was being hosted by a man by the name of Simon, who was a Pharisee. And during that day, the uh, Pharisee would invite very often, the leader would invite somebody to the place, and as he invited them to their place, he, he would spend time with them and ask them questions, and, and the city could be invited to come and join in this particular meal. And, and so Simon had invited Jesus Christ to come to his house for a dinner. And as Jesus was there reclining at, at the meal, because they, didn't, they weren't seated in tables as we are with chairs, they would have a low-lying table, and they had cushions, and they would lay on their cushions on their left side with their left elbow on the ground and, or on the cushion, and the right hand they would use to reach and to take the food off the table. And, and so Jesus was there with his feet outstretched, and he was reaching and he was eating. And as this is taking place, the people are there at this dinner party when suddenly the room becomes silent because a well-known sinner has entered into the room, prostitute. And as this prostitute has entered into the room, you could almost hear the sound diminishing until it's silent as she's making her way through the room. And, and she's weeping as she does so, perhaps even stumbling with the tears blinding her eyes until she makes her way to Jesus. And as she's weeping there, her, her feet that are spilling off of her chin begin to, to run on his feet and causing little rivulets of tears and all. And, and she kneels down and she takes the hair, her hair, and begins to dry his feet and then begins to kiss his feet. And Simon is watching this and is disgusted by this. And he says, if, the, if this man truly were a prophet, he would know who and what manner of woman this is who is touching him because she's a sinner. I mean, everybody knows. I mean, you don't even have to be a prophet to know a prostitute when you see one. What's wrong with this man? Why is he allowing her to touch him in such a fashion. And that's when Jesus speaks to him. I have something to say to you, Simon. He says, well, say on. There's a man, Jesus says, who, who had a debt of money owed by two others. One owed him a great sum, the other a lesser amount. And, and the man who was owed the sum of money from both of those debtors completely forgave both of them. I want to ask you a question, Simon. Who's going to love him most? And Simon, looking at Jesus, says, well, I suppose the one who he, you know, who, who had the biggest debt. And that's when Jesus just hits Simon between the eyes. Do you see this woman? You know, a lot of people don't see other human beings. What they, what they see are bad people, threatening people, mean people. We, we have a tendency of judging on the outside. We, we think that our experience in life gives us the ability to have that kind of discernment. That's not always true, is it? Some of the most special and sweet and loving people I've ever met were the ones I was first afraid of. I remember a guy who was in one of my Bible studies many years ago. It was a Thursday study, and he was a big dude. He was a big dude, big dude. And he always sat in the same place every Thursday, always sat in the same place. And he would just, his eyes just pierce through me every time. And I would look at him, I'd be teaching, and he'd just be staring me down. And it made me uncomfortable. I thought, man, what's with this guy? Why is he mad dogging me? <laughs> what I do to him? And it really did. It, it worked on my head. Well, later on, he, he actually was a barber, and he started cutting my hair. <laughs> and one day... I was talking to him, and he says, you know, I came to the Thursday Bible study, and I said, yeah, I remember. He said, yeah, I would stare at you. I said, I remember. <laughs> and he says, you know what I was thinking? And I said, no, what? He said, I was thinking, man, I want to cut his hair. <laughs> That's a fact. That's a true story. I'm not kidding. That's a true story. I started laughing. You never know. And it's important, isn't it important? Do you see this woman? Isn't it important for us to see human beings and not the activity of that person? We're all sinners. Not a single one of us is perfect other than Jesus Christ. We know that. What gives me the right to judge somebody else? I am a sinner saved by the grace of God. And I don't have a right to say, oh, Jesus can't save you. You got tattoos? man. Oh, you got marks of the monster beast. And you've got piercings. I mean, what's with us today? Jesus Christ has a way of, of, of not only catching the fish, but he has a way of cleaning it after he catches it. And it's up to him to do that.
And he does it through his word by his spirit and through the loving fellowship of brothers and sisters who encourage people to walk with Jesus Christ. And he does it that way. So he says, do you see this woman? Yeah, you can clap. Now that's a good thing. Yeah. Yeah. Now what I'm going to do is I'm going to loop that clap through every message I ever give and put it on the radio, and they'll think we've got a fantastic church. But anyway, do you see this woman? And then he says, listen, I came in, and you didn't show me the great courtesies that are normal for any guest. You didn't wash my feet. You didn't anoint my head with oil. You didn't even give me a common kiss of greeting. Those are the three basic things that would happen if you went to somebody's house. You'd walk in, they would kiss you, you'd be seated, they would wash your feet, then they'd anoint you. He said, you didn't do any of that. But this woman here, this woman here, from the moment I came in, has been ministering to me. He said something that I think is beautiful. He said in Luke 7, 44, it says that, that he turned to the woman and he said to Simon, do you see this woman? I entered your house. You gave me no water for my feet. She has washed my feet with her tears, wiped them with the hair of her head. Washed my feet with her tears. Now, yes, I'm certain that as she was coming to Christ, there were tears that formed on her chin, but there's something that goes along with that. I was mentioning this the other day. If you go to Israel, you go into some of the shops that sell antiquities, and, and you can go into a shop, and they will have different things that are couple thousand years old and all, or they've been fabricated to look like something that came out of that period, and they have what they call tear vials, tear vials. You can buy tear vials in Israel to this day. We've been in the shop, we have seen them, and you can buy them. They're called tear vials because they are remembering that, that the psalmist said to the Lord, to keep my tears in your bottle, are they not written in your book? And so, during the time of Christ, the women could have what is called a tear vial. It was like on a, a chain, if you will. It was like a necklace. And all the pain that she would feel and all the tears that would come out of sorrow, she would collect in the bottle. And then she would seal it. And then when she went through a trauma or mourning or deep sorrow again, she would unseal it and she would catch more tears. The tear bottle was about six inches in length and could hold some fluid. So when this woman came to, to Jesus and washed his feet with her tears, it's very possible that she was washing his feet with the tears that she had collected that were reminders of her pain and her suffering and the grief of a lifetime. And she used these tears to wash Jesus' feet because Jesus had healed her broken heart. Jesus had won her love. She had been a very sinful woman but she had been cleansed by a very loving Savior. And she said, my broken heart has been healed because of you. And I kiss your feet for bringing me the love. That's what Jesus has done for you. And that's why we respond in love to him. We serve him and we love him because he first loved us. Never forget that. And I don't serve him to make me him love me, I serve him because he does love me. And that's how it works in the kingdom of God. Mary was like this unnamed woman. Mary knew she had many sins, but Mary also knew that she was forgiven. And again, that produces love. And Mary loved Jesus and was a devoted follower, and she was a Christian disciple. His men, they were nowhere to be found. But she wasn't afraid of being associated in the open with Jesus Christ. She knew that that faith in him had resulted in forgiveness and a brand new life. And because his message was of truth and love for her, she had the courage to identify with him. It's like what Paul says in Romans 1.16 when he said, I'm not ashamed of the gospel. It is the power of God for the salvation of everyone who believes, for the Jew first and then for the Gentile. She wasn't ashamed to identify, even though it was dangerous. She wasn't ashamed to identify. And she looks into this tomb. She sees the angels, and they ask her a question. Verse 13, woman, why are you weeping? In other words, your tears are unnecessary. Why are you crying? You ought to be rejoicing that his body's gone. And here you are, sobbing your heart out. 
Well, she answers in verse 13, they've taken away my Lord. I don't know where they've laid him. Somebody removed his body from the tomb. I don't know where they took it. Now, this is interesting because Mary reminds me of, of myself and many other believers that, that are alive even to this day. Jesus is alive. The Bible teaches us that he's alive. That's why we celebrate the resurrection of Christ. That's why we celebrate Easter, because he's alive. We sing he's alive. We, 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 we read scriptures that tell us he's alive. And then when we go through a problem, we act as if he isn't. We act as if they've taken away the body of my Lord, and I don't know where he is. We think that sometimes that we're left on our own, that we've got nobody to help us. And, and yet the Bible teaches me very clearly that, that Jesus Christ ever lives to make intercession for me, that he's alive, that he's transformed my life, that he has made it possible for me to have life in him. And, and it's all based on, on not simply the preaching of the gospel without the resurrection, but it's the resurrection that certifies everything he preached is true. Because if the Lord Jesus Christ would have died and remained in that tomb, then, then we of all people have a futile faith, a, a, a vain faith because we're teaching that Jesus is alive when in reality he's dead. And that makes him no different than Buddha or Muhammad or any other person who brought religious or philosophic teachings to the world. But we believe that Jesus Christ is alive. And if we believe that he's alive, then we need to understand nobody took his body away. He's still present with us and he's able to help us in our time of need. That's what it means to be a Christian. And that's what it means to live for him because he's alive and he's there to take care of the need because he loves you and he's willing to do it. We need to understand that today because a lot of people are what are called practical atheists. On the one hand, we know our doctrine, but on the other hand, we don't live it. But the Lord has said, no, I'm alive. And you know that. Paul in Ephesians chapter 1, verse 3 said it like this. He said, blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us with every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places in Christ. Every spiritual blessing we receive through Jesus Christ. Because he's alive, we are new creations. Old things are passed away. Because he is alive, we have been redeemed from the kingdom of darkness. Because he's alive, we can overcome by the blood of the lamb and the word of our testimony. Because he's alive, we are more than conquerors through Jesus Christ who loved us. Because he's alive, we are heirs of God and joint heirs with Jesus Christ. Because he's alive, we have life. Because the one who has the Son has life, and the one who does not have the Son of God does not have life. Because he's alive, we have love. Because the love of God is shed abroad in our hearts. Because he's alive, we have joy, and it's a joy that no man can take from us. Because he's alive, we are forgiven because the blood of Jesus Christ cleanses us from all sin. Because he's alive, we have peace. We have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. Because he's alive, we have provision because my God shall supply all of my need. Because he's alive, we have power because Jesus said you shall receive power after that the Holy Spirit has come upon you. And because he's alive, we have a home in heaven because Jesus said, in my Father's house are many mansions and I go and prepare a place for you. I rejoice because Jesus Christ is alive. And that is something the church needs to remember. He's alive. As this is taking place, it says in verse 14, when she said this, she turned around, saw Jesus standing there, didn't know that it was Jesus. Jesus said to her, woman, why are you weeping? Whom are you seeking? She, supposing him to be the gardener, said to him, Sir, if you have carried him away, tell me where you have laid him, and I will take him away. Jesus said to her, Mary. She turned and said to him, Ravoni, which is to say, teacher. Jesus said to her, Do not cling to me, for I have not yet ascended to my father. But go to my brethren and say to them, I am ascending to my father and your father, to my God, and your God. Mary Magdalene came and told the disciples that she had seen the Lord, that he had spoken these things to her. Why are you weeping? You see, she didn't recognize him. It's early in the morning. She's emotionally distressed. She's blinded by tears. She didn't expect to see him alive. She's confused. So he says, why are you weeping? Then he says, whom are you seeking? 
under stress and under grief, Mary has forgotten the promises, which incidentally is what happens to us too. We can go through stress and grief and forget his promises. Now he had said in John 14, 28, you have heard me say to you, I'm going away and coming back to you. If you loved me, you would rejoice because I said I'm going to the Father for my Father is greater than I. Rather than weeping and sorrowing and carrying on the way that you are, you really ought to be rejoicing because I've gone to prepare a place for you. But as this is taking place, she may have been aware of his teaching, but it wasn't something that she could truly grasp at that moment. You see, she's still learning the basic lessons of the Christian faith. Here's a little practical thing for all of us in this room. Just because the Lord may want to teach us a lesson doesn't mean that we learn the lesson the first time. There are things that the Lord will teach you over and over again until you finally get it. Then he moves you to another lesson. That's how it works. When Jesus was uh, with his disciples in John 13 and, and he was washing their feet and all and the apostle Peter got upset at Jesus because Jesus was washing their feet and he had said to him, you will never wash my feet. And Jesus speaking to him said, if I don't wash your feet, you have no part of me. And the apostle Peter then says, then basically give me a bath because I want to be close to you. And Jesus said something that I've marked in my heart. It's found in John 13, verse 7, where Jesus said, what I am doing, you do not understand now, but you will know after this. There are things that you go through and lessons that you're in the process of learning that you're not even aware you're learning yet, but you do learn them. And later on, you're able to connect the dots spiritually and say, oh, so the Lord led me here to do this because he had something that he was going to do with me over here. And he was teaching me something here so that I might be prepared for something over there. And that's what's taking place in Mary. And, and so you do not feel discouraged that it seems that you learn the same kind of lesson over and over again. Just begin to learn the lesson so you can move on. Now it says in verse 15, supposing him to be the gardener, she said, if you carried away him away, let me know and I'll go and take him. I'll take him away myself. That's a great picture of the burden of religion, a small woman carrying a dead body of a teacher. Religions invented by men basically have disciples burdened by a dead teacher and their teaching. Our own efforts can't result in spiritual peace with God. Only forgiveness can heal your soul. And that's what Jesus Christ came to do, to forgive us. And that's why we come to him in faith. It's not that we try to make ourselves better. We can't make ourselves good at all. It's simply coming to the realization that I'm not good enough. I had a friend of mine many years ago now when I first got saved. And I was speaking to him and I said, Nick, you need to give your heart to Christ. And he says, I intend to do that. And I said, and when are you going to do that? He says, when I can get myself cleaned up enough to offer myself to him. And I said, Nikki, that means you never will because you're never going to be good enough for Jesus Christ. Come as you are, and he'll clean you up. You come as you are. There may be some in this room right now saying, you know, I, I'm not worthy. And, and with you, I say, amen, none of us are. I'm not worthy, but he is. I'm unable, but he is able. I, I can't forgive sin, but he does. I can sin, but he forgives my sin. I don't take that as an excuse, excuse to continue in sin. I just thank God for the grace that delivers me from its power and its oppression. And so the Lord wants to do that work in us. You see, Christians don't carry around the body of a dead master. We have a living Lord. We have a Lord who loves us. We have a Lord who carries us. We have a Lord who delivers us. Even as it says in Isaiah 46, verse 4, where God said, even to your old age, I am he. And even to gray hairs, I will carry you. I have made and I will bear, even I will carry and will deliver you. I'll do that. You're like you're my baby and I will carry you. So as this is taking place, verse 16, Jesus said to her, Mary. And she turned and said to him, Rabboni. Rabboni means my dear master, my dear teacher. She hears the voice of the shepherd, a personal shepherd who personally knew her. And he spoke her name in a way that she she heard, I don't know about you, maybe I have some people, I'm sure I do, who were big people on campus, you were the big woman on campus, everybody knew your name, or you're the big man on campus, everybody thought you were the coolest thing. I wasn't that. Nobody knew my name. 
As a matter of fact, whenever I was introduced, I was always the and you. Say, hi, Bill, how you doing? Hey, Jim, how you doing? And you, how, how, that was me. That's me. I'm the hey, you. And for the longest time, I'm telling you, the longest time, I thought, I wish somebody knew my name. I wish somebody knew my name. And I did all kinds of crazy things to get attention so that somebody would remember how crazy David is. You want to know what happened? Finally, one day, the Lord said, it doesn't matter if anybody else knows your name. I do. He calls his sheep by name. And you may be one of those invisible people. You may be one of those who think that nobody knows that you're even alive. Let me remind you, there is somebody who knows you're alive. His name is Jesus, and he loves you, and he gave his life up for you. He loves you. He calls his sheep by name. A personal shepherd who personally knew her. He says to her in verses 17 and 18, we'll roll to a conclusion. He says, do not cling to me. Let me go. There's a new work that is occurring. I'm no longer to be physically present with you. You see, in John 14, he said, in verse 15 to 18, he said, if you love me, you'll obey what I command, and I will ask the Father, and he will give you another comforter to be with you forever. The spirit of truth. The world cannot accept him because it neither sees him nor knows him, but you know him, for he lives with you and will be in you. I will not leave you as orphans. I will come to you. I will not leave you without support. I will not leave you without fellowship. I will not leave you alone. I will not leave you as an orphan. I will come to you. The Holy Spirit will live within you and will be within you and never leave you. When my mom died a couple of years ago now, one of our friends, uh, Sandy McIntosh, the wife of uh, Mike McIntosh, was speaking to me. And uh, I'll never forget how with her gentle sweetness, and I love, I, love, I love Sandy very much, and Sandy was looking at me with the gentleness of a, such a sweetheart, and I'll never forget she looked at me when my mom died, and she said, uh, you're an orphan. You're an orphan. And I said, yeah, I've been thinking about that. My dad's with Jesus, and now my mom is with Jesus, yeah. But I'm not an orphan. Jesus said, I will not leave you orphans. I will come to you. No, I'm never alone. He is with me. He never leaves me. He never forsakes me. He dwells within me. Jesus is with you too if you're born again. And he doesn't leave you alone. He made a promise that he would always be with you. And Jesus went to heaven that he might send the Spirit to dwell with us. And what does she do? Well, in verse 18, she came and told the disciples that she had seen the Lord. He had spoken these things to her. She testified of what Jesus told her. And even to this day, believers are commanded to tell everyone. We share. We share with family. We share with friends. When we have the opportunity and it's a proper moment, we share with coworkers. We share with any we have opportunity to share with about Jesus Christ. And that's what we're doing today. We're sharing that Jesus Christ is alive. We're sharing that he is willing to be with us, that he is willing to be in our life. Easter is special to me in many ways, and I'll close with this. Obviously, there's the biblical reason for it being special, but it carries with it a special memory. I got saved in 1970. I brought my sister Madeline to faith in Christ the day I got saved. The day I got saved, December 27th. Three weeks later, I led my mom and my dad to faith in Christ. I told them what Jesus had done, and they came to faith in Christ. A couple of years later, three and a half years or so later, my brother Frank came to faith in Christ. When Frank came to faith in Christ, I started teaching a Bible study in the city of Ontario in 1974. And a young woman showed up at that Bible study by the name of Marie. And Marie, two weeks into the Bible study, attending with me, was led to the Lord by my sister Madeline. And Marie came to faith in Christ. Tell somebody, tell somebody, tell somebody, and watch what God will do. My sister Becky, though, my sister Becky hadn't come to faith in Christ, though she became interested in the claims of Christ. And when I went into the military in 1971, my sister Becky began to attend a church, a local church. It wasn't a Calvary church. It was a local church in Santa Fe Springs. 
And there was a woman who served there on staff who seduced my sister into lesbianism when my sister turned 18. And my sister Rebecca began to live a lesbian lifestyle for over 20 years. And one day in the city of Ontario, I was talking to Becky in front of my sister Madeline's house. And I said, Becky, I love you with all of my heart. And there's nothing you can ever do that will make me as your brother ashamed of you or not love you. I love you with all of my heart. I said, honey, I said, your lesbianism isn't the worst sin. Sin separates you from God. But it is the sin that is your besetting sin. It's the sin that you're practicing. I said, and I'm concerned. And so I'm going to tell you the truth. And I shared the gospel with her more clearly, face to face, sitting there in the front yard at my sister Madeline's house on Harvard Street, 700 block of Harvard in the city of Ontario. Becky spoke to me and she said, well, you know, I've been thinking about that, but I'll, whatever, you're my brother, I love you, and I appreciate your care. I said, it's not just, it's not, it's not just care, sweetheart. Those who commit such sins will not enter the kingdom of heaven. I'm not concerned simply for your behavior. I'm, I'm concerned for your eternity. And this sin makes a separation. And you will not enter the kingdom of God. And I'm greatly concerned for you. And I'd see her, and sometimes she'd have one of her friends. She didn't have a lot of relationships, but she did have long-term relationships with a couple women, two, three women. They would come, I would see them, but they live in another state. She lives in New Mexico. And one day in 1998, on Easter, I was doing exactly what I'm doing right now, giving a study and coming to a conclusion, and I gave an invitation, as I will in a moment. And I gave more than one opportunity. And the very last opportunity, I said, listen, if you're here and you know God is speaking to you, please get up, give your heart to Christ. And I have my eyes closed. And then I opened my eyes, and right in front of me in the center aisle in the very back was my dad and my mom, my sister Becky, standing there as Becky gave her heart to the Lord Jesus Christ on Easter. 1998, and she struggled at first because the entanglements of such a lifestyle are not easily broken, but she has been free and has been walking with the Lord now since she gave her heart to Jesus in 1998. God forgives sin. God forgives sin. And, and I believe this with all of my heart, Tell someone. Tell them how much God loves them. Tell them that Jesus died on the cross for them. Tell them that, that we're all sinners in need of the grace of God and that Jesus was buried, but on the third day he rose from the dead for our justification, that he ascended into heaven, sent the Holy Spirit to indwell those who believed in him and prepared a place for us because one day, one day, one day, I look forward to seeing him face to face and I am longing to hear these words. I am longing to hear him say, well done, my good, my faithful servant. I am longing for that. And I pray that you are too, that that motivates your life. I don't care about the well dones of men. I want to hear the well done from Jesus Christ, the one who saved me, gave his life up for me. And may you have the same hope. 